the official podcast of the Jacksonville Public Library. I'm Hurley Winkler. And I'm Jenna Hassel. Today's episode is a real treat. We have Dr. Adam Rosenblatt, who is an assistant professor of biology for the University of North Florida. Jenna, are you a science fan? I mean, I was today with all of his amazing knowledge. Oh my gosh. Yeah. This guy is doing a crazy experiment involving alligator eggs on a rooftop at UNF on an undisclosed location. And at first we did think that it was some sort of creative solution to University of North Florida's goose problem. Mm -hmm. But I don't think it is, though it could work. I mean, if they all hatch, all 200 of them, well, he said about half of them might hatch. About 200 alligators. 400 eggs up there. Mm -hmm. Excuse me. Oh, what just happened? 400 eggs up there, and about half of them may hatch. Yeah, so we're talking 200 alligators running around UNF taking care of the goose problem. Yeah. Seems like a good solution to me, but... You know, one time when I was a student there way back in the day... Mm, way back. Way back. A goose bit me. <laughs> On my leg. No. I was just walking by, minding my own business, wasn't upsetting the geese at all, which I've been known to chase them occasionally. Probably stepped in goose poop that day. It's fine. It's fine. It happens every day. And then this goose, this like rogue goose comes up and just takes a chunk out of my leg. Oh my God. Yeah. And I was like, what the heck, goose? What are you doing? So the alligators should probably get on this problem. Yeah. It's it's terrible. It's Un- terrible. Yeah. Unfortunately, Dr. Rosenblatt doesn't have that mindset with his experiment, but we feel like he should. So here we have Dr. Rosenblatt with his alligator research. Dr. Rosenblatt, thank you so much for coming on Completely Booked today. We're excited to have you. Thank you for having me. This is a very exciting time. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about what brought you to the Jacksonville area. You just moved here last August, correct? Yes. I'm a newbie, just been here for less than a year. And what brought me was the job that I have now, where I'm an assistant professor at UNF um, in the biology department. And yeah, that's what brought me down here. And I was really excited to come back to Florida because I did my PhD in Miami. Oh, okay. And that's where I first got involved with alligator research down there in the Everglades. And so when this job became available and I saw it, I was like, I have to apply because I could do more alligator research in Florida. It's the perfect place. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Awesome. What do you like about Jacksonville so far? I love the um, size of the city. It's like the biggest city in the country. That's mm-hmm. correct. <laughs> which yeah. is kind of crazy. I didn't realize that. I always thought it would be um, uh, Phoenix or Houston because those cities are like, they're wide, right? Mm-hmm. And they're kind of massive. Mm-hmm. But then Jacksonville's the biggest city. And I like that because then there's a lot of different areas to explore, right? And there's a lot of variation in what's uh, what's going on here. Um, and I just can't, you know, Southern food. How do you get beyond Southern that food? That is a great point. It's That's the true. best. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Do you have a favorite dish? Uh, favorite dish. I mean, besides gator tail. <laughs> I actually, oh. <laughs> I do love gator tail. I firmly believe that to study an animal, you have to know what that animal tastes like. Like unless it's an endangered species, right? right? I mean, right. I'm not going to tell you to eat like you know a manatee or something. That's but, very good. Um, alligators are abundant, and it's served everywhere, and it's delicious. Mm-hmm. Or at least I think it's delicious. Um, no, I love uh, shrimp and grits, and we have great shrimp oh. here in Jacksonville too, That's which is true. fantastic. Mayport shrimp, Good old Mayport gotta love shrimp. them. Yeah. Yep. I never knew my wife was so into grits until we moved here. Interesting. She has grits at like every meal that we ever go out for. Is she from the South originally? No, she's from Utah. Oh, interesting. <laughs> yeah, I guess it's it, a commodity. They don't yeah. know anything about grits in Utah. So, well, they're um, delicious, so she figured it out. Yeah. She did. <laughs> but she went to grad school in South Carolina. Okay. And so maybe she got a little bit of the grits, you know, bug there. That's probably it. Yeah. That'll do it. That'll do it sometimes. <laughs> so what led you to study biology? Um, I have always been fascinated by animals, especially large animals that could potentially hurt me. Um, like most kids, I think, or not most kids, but a lot of kids who, and a lot of people who end up in biology, we get fascinated by, you know, the nature documentaries, right? So like, you know, that nature, uh, I think it's called nature on PBS, that series. Mm -hmm. I grew up watching that series. I loved it so much. And then of course all the David Attenborough stuff, you know? And, um, so I got, that was my in And then um, I had two cats growing up and a turtle, box turtle, who was obviously named Mr. Turtle. Obviously. As you do. As you do. And one day I put them together, right? I took the turtle out of the cage and I put it on the floor with my cats and I watched them interact. 
And I was like, what's going to happen here? That's fascinating. And the cats kind of like went up to him and like tapped him on the shell a little bit with their paw, you know, and the turtle just like went into his shell and was like, I don't want to deal with this. This is scary. And so I got fascinated by animal behavior. You know, I was like, how do animals interact with each other? How do they, how do they know what to do? Clearly, you know, a cat is a carnivore, right? So they're going to approach the world in a certain way, whereas a turtle is an herbivore. They're going to approach the world in a different way. And I just got um, the bug. Yeah. So you went from a fascination with cats and turtles to a fascination with alligators. Yes. How did the alligators come into play? The alligators is just one of those random sort of twists of fate where I was um, I'd done some internships where I'd worked with manatees and I'd worked with um, uh, by with I mean like observing manatees I wasn't like handling manatees but I worked on this project in Belize where we were studying manatee behaviors then I worked on a project in Hawaii where we were studying um, humpback whales. And then I went to Australia and was studying sharks in Australia, which was really exciting. And I was studying with the guy who was going to become my Ph.D. advisor. And so we were talking about project ideas for my Ph.D. And I said, you know, you're a shark guy. You know, I have some ideas for some shark research. And then he said, you know, I've been looking for somebody to start an alligator program at in my lab. And I said, I'm in. That's it. All he had to do was say alligator. I didn't know anything about alligators. I had never... thought about alligators really because I grew up in the northeast I didn't know anything about alligators but he said um, you know that the opportunity was there and I was like I jumped all over it I was like yes that sounds great wow yeah (laughs) so what first struck you about the alligators what was the first thing that really interested you in this species Um, well from like a popular perspective it was how Um, they've been around for such a long time, you know, like alligators and not the alligator species, but alligators, the ancestors of alligators, what we would call in the crocodilian sort of order, right? There's an order of crocodilians and the crocodilian order has been around for about 200 million years. Um, you know, they've been around since, uh, um, the time of the dinosaurs and even after the dinosaurs. And the only animal group that I know of that has been around longer than alligators is uh, consistently is the sharks. Sharks have been around for about 400 million years. Um, but so, um, you know, how can an animal group like survive for that long? Like, you know, you think about the thing that killed the dinosaurs, the asteroid, right? The KT extinction event. And that killed all the dinosaurs, but that, you know, the crocodilians survived just fine and they're still with us today. So like they're these really resilient animals, um, that are able to adapt to all kinds of different conditions. And so that's what really, um, fascinated me about them and drew me to them. Wow. I had no idea that. The crocodilians had such a rich history. Very rich history. And the fossil crocodilians are fascinating. So I don't study fossils. So I'm speaking a little bit out of turn here. But I read some of the fossil literature when it comes to crocodilians. And like if you go into the past, like the types of crocodilians that were around back in, you know, millions of years ago, like put these crocodiles to shame that we have today. Right. Like there were like 30 foot long marine crocodiles that would eat like great white sharks. Right. Or like there were like land crocodiles that were just let, they only lived on the land and they would like walk on all fours and they would, you know, kind of, they would hunt like, you know, like, like mammals basically. Right. Like it was incredible and they were huge. Um, and nowadays, you know, the largest one we have is still impressive. The saltwater crocodile in Australia and the South Pacific that, that one still get up to, it still gets up to, um, more than 20 feet long. Um, but that's the largest one we have. Literal dinosaur. Yeah. Literal dinosaur. Oh, oh yeah. but a question, but, uh, a correction, not a literal dinosaur. Uh, <laughs> it's not <laughs> no. just descendants of, <laughs> yes. right? Actually not related to dinosaurs. I know a lot of people think that alligators are living dinosaurs, crocodiles are living dinosaurs. So dinosaurs and crocodilians were around at the same time um, and they descended from the same common ancestor, which are called archosaurs. But the crocodilians are not descended from dinosaurs is the point. Ah. Okay. I read something. Okay. I did a little, my own little research today. Do it. Drop it on us. Drop it. Is it true that they were descendants of birds which are descendants of dinosaurs? So birds are descendants of dinosaurs. Birds are true dinosaurs. Okay. Um, crocodilians are not, I mean, they're related to birds through, you know, just that ancestry, mm-hmm. of the, the archosaurian ancestry, but the, they're not descended from the birds. Okay. But what's fascinating is that they have very similar, um, in some cases, they have very similar characteristics of like their body plans. So th- uh, do you want me to get into the weeds about this? You want oh, me to nerd out about absolutely. this? Absolutely. <laughs> Let's nerd out. Okay. We are queens of nerding out. Let's 
Let's do it. Let's do it. Humor us. Because this is some super nerdy stuff. Okay. So you and me, mammals, we have a type of breathing, right? That's called tidal breathing, where we breathe in and it comes, you know, down through the um, uh, through our mouths and then it comes down into our lungs. And then when we breathe out, it comes out through the same pathway, right? Like the air reverses direction and goes back out the same way it came in. Birds do not breathe tidally. They breathe circularly where the air comes in one way, but then it goes around kind of in a U shape and it still comes out their mouth, but it comes out from a different hole, if that huh. makes sense. Like an, another hole that leads to the mouth. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. Right. So they're breathing in sort of a U shape and that's a very efficient way of breathing. Like we're able, our lungs are able to, and the way we breathe, we're able to extract like, I don't know, 60% of the oxygen from the air that we breathe, but a bunch of the oxygen we don't use. We just breathe it back out again. Mm -hmm. Um, Birds are able, depending on the species, they can extract like close to 100% of the oxygen. So it's much more efficient. And when it comes to alligators, it was just discovered a couple years ago that alligators breathe in the same way that birds do, where they breathe in that circular way rather than a tidal way. So it's just showing how closely connects, yeah. connected and related they actually are. Yeah. Ah, that's fascinating. I didn't even realize things breathe differently. Things breathe the very more differently. You know. Yeah. <laughs> the more you know. So we first found out about your the work you're doing with UNF in Matt Sorgel's column in the Florida Times Union. I'm a very big fan. Mm-hmm. Um, you're doing an experiment. Um, involving alligator eggs. So tell us a little bit about that experiment. Yeah, for sure. So the Alligators, along with a lot of different species of reptiles, um, like all sea turtles, um, some species of lizards, um, one species of snake was just discovered to have this. They have this type of um, sex determination, right, in their um, in their embryos. So when you think about humans, whether we're males or females, is determined by our genetics, right? You either have two X chromosomes and you're a you're a woman, or you have two or you have an X and a Y chromosome and you're a man, right? Um, And that's true for all mammals. When it comes to these reptile species, including the crocodilians, the uh, sex of the offspring is determined by the temperature of the nest, right? So it's it's called temperature-dependent sex determination. And it's kind of the strange thing. You're like, why would that be the case? Like, why why isn't everything just determined by genetics? Um, And the idea is that in these reptiles, there's some adaptive advantage to having a female at one temperature and a male at a different temperature that they somehow are able to um, capitalize on being um, being hatched at those different temperatures and then produce more offspring throughout their life. And that's been proven for one species so far, but it's a very difficult um, theory to prove, unfortunately. Um, so right now it's more of just like still an idea. But yeah, so back to the main point. So alligators have this type of temperature dependent sex determination and you can you know, connect the dots and say that as climate change continues, if air temperatures are gonna go up, that could impact the balance of males and females in alligator populations. And we've already seen these kinds of things in sea turtle populations. So to my knowledge, I'm doing the first experiment to manipulate the um, temperature environment of you know, nests that I'm uh, controlling and seeing how the balance of males and females that come out of those nests might shift based on the temperature treatment. Interesting. So yeah. how many eggs do you have? Total, we have 400 eggs. Wow, that's a lot of alligators. It's a lot of potential alligators. Potential um, alligators. Potential alligators. Because they're not the, they're not all going to hatch. I'm going to tell you that right now. Okay. In the wild... Um, not all eggs in a nest hatch. Like it's very, it's rare for that to happen um, for a variety of reasons, right? Like something, maybe the temperature got too high in a certain part of the nest and it, you know, killed the embryo or whatever. Um, so we have 400 eggs. I'm expecting maybe between 200 to 300 alligators to hatch. Um, and they're arranged in 20 different nests. Each nest has 20 eggs in it. And we're going to see what's the balance between males and females that come out. So, how did you arrange the nests? The nests are arranged according, I tried to mimic a real nest as much as possible. So in the wild, real, real alligator nests, they have a base of, uh, you know, dirt mostly like, or mud, um, if they're built in like a wetland. And then they just like pick up all of the plant material that's around and they pile it up into a pile to make a nest mound. Um, and so we used hay cause if hay is just dried grass, right. And like alligators in the wild will also use grass. And so we put down a dirt base in these kiddie pools and we put the grass on top, the hay on top. Um, and then we covered some of the nests with these uh, structures that act uh, like warming, sort of passive greenhouse warming devices to warm up the nests. And where are you keeping the nests? The nests are on the UNF campus. Um, I'm not going to tell you exactly where they are because 
Um, alligator egg poaching is a real thing in Florida, which I did not realize. Is it a, a real while. thing in Jacksonville, Florida? I've never heard about it in Jacksonville, but did you hear about the story? This was uh, maybe a year ago, maybe two years ago. I can't remember exactly, but Florida Fish and Wildlife, alligator egg poaching had become a serious problem and illegally, like what happens is these eggs will get poached from wild nests and then the eggs get um, sold to... Um, I think mostly alligator farmers, right? Because alligator farmers make money off of the eggs because they raise them into hatchlings and then they, so they, they sell the hides and they sell the meat. And so there was there were these um, rumors about how there was a lot of illegal egg poaching going on. And so Florida Fish and Wildlife set up a fake alligator farm. Like they staffed it. They had, you know, alligators there. They made it look as real as possible. They set up a fake alligator farm and they then basically put out a call. They said, like, you know, we want all the eggs anybody can give us. And they got a bunch of illegal alligator egg harvesters or poachers to come and try to sell their eggs to them. And I think FWC ended up prosecuting like nine different people who were illegally doing this with wow. alligator eggs. That sounds like a Carl Hyacin novel. Yeah. That does not sound real. Yeah, but it's wow. totally real. Oh, Florida. <laughs> I know. Always a good story. Always a good alligator story. <laughs> Seriously. And so these, uh, so yeah, I'm not trying to reveal where they actually are on the UNF campus because I, I don't want anybody to know exactly where they are. Um, but yeah, they're on the UNF campus somewhere. On a roof, right? <laughs> on a rooftop, okay. yes. Wow. And is UNF preparing for its own kind of Jurassic Park event here? Like when all the them, <laughs> they, <laughs> they <should>. hatch. <laughs> they should do a <laughs> fundraiser. <laughs> they're not, somebody, one of my students wanted us to have a hatch party, uh-huh. like, like a gender reveal party. Oh, like, that would you know, be gender hilarious. Reveal parties. That would be hilarious. But I told them, you know, this is a scientific experiment. I don't really know if I want to do a gender reveal party for like, 400 alligators. <laughs> that's a, sounds like a lot of work to me. Mm-hmm. That's fair. And we already have a lot of work because just taking care of the animals is going to be, you know, its own uh, endeavor. That's um, probably a higher priority than the party. Yeah, yeah. much okay. higher priority. That's okay. That's fair. Yeah. That is fair. <laughs> I appreciate your understanding. <laughs> of course. <laughs> you traveled to Louisiana to pick up the eggs from a wildlife refuge. What was that journey like? That journey was very exciting. Um, I drove a van, a UNF van. Uh, it was an 11 hour drive. Wow. I went to the Rockefeller Wildlife Refuge, which is um, about an hour and a half west of New Orleans. Um, and it's right on the coast. And it's this beautiful place where they've done alligator research for decades. Um, and they collect alligator eggs from their wild population every year for scientific purposes and also to give to um, alligator farmers in the state of Louisiana. And so I drove there. I collected the eggs. We put them in these big plastic tubs. And you pack them in like dirt so that they won't move around and roll around because then they could get damaged. And then I drove them 11 hours back the next day. So in two days, I did a 22 hour round trip drive. Yeah. That's incredible. Yeah. So why couldn't you get the eggs from a refuge in Florida? Great question. So, of course, there are alligator eggs in Florida because there are one and a half million alligators in Florida and they produce eggs. Um, and it's really just a logistical thing. It turns out that it's the eggs that are collected in Florida. It's, um, they're collected a little bit later in the incubation cycle when the eggs are older. And for my experiment, I needed to have eggs that were young, very young eggs that had just been freshly laid. And the reason is because there's something called the thermosensitive period. We're really nerding out. These are some, we're going to get into some like deep biology nerdism. Let's Um, do it. I'm ready. The thermosensitive period is when the sex is determined, right? So whatever the temperature is during the thermosensitive period, that's what's going to determine whether an alligator becomes a male or a female. And the thermosensitive period in alligators is right now thought to start around day 15. Um, And so I I can't use eggs that are older than day 15 or else they would have already entered the thermosensitive period, right? So in Louisiana, I was able to get eggs reliably that were less than 15 days old. Whereas here in Florida, I would not have reliably reliably been able to get eggs that were that young. Some fresh eggs. Need fresh eggs. Gotta have it. Gotta have it. <laughs> <laughs> and the eggs are expected to start hatching in August, correct? Yeah, the incubation period for alligator eggs is between 60, about 60 and 75 days. Um, and the hotter ones are probably going to hatch first. And then the cooler ones are probably going to hatch second. Okay. Yeah. So what are your feelings around the anticipated hatch of the eggs? I feel like a new parent. It feels <laughs> so exciting, you know. Parent um, 200. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, about to have a lot of babies. And it's mostly excitement. It's a lot of um, trepidation, right? Because you don't know how many are going to hatch. You have to take care of them for a little while before they go back to Louisiana, which is where they're going to end up um, uh, permanently. But... You know, we're just, it's just going to be a lot of 
little animals that we have to be watching over and measuring and figuring out the sex of, and it's just going to be kind of a madhouse. Me and my students were going to be working very hard for about two weeks or so, three weeks maybe. Yeah, how long would that take to determine the sex of all of the eggs that hatch? Um, it depends how good you are at sexing a baby alligator. Mm. <laughs> um, it's huh. a uh, I don't know interesting... anyone that's good at that. Sorry, I can't help. <laughs> I, I, think I, I know people who there are good you at go. it. I think I could be. <laughs> If given proper training, I think this is something I could do. Yeah, yeah sign us comes, up. We'll help. It yeah. all comes down to training and experience. Just the more tiny little baby alligator penises you see, the better you get at identifying there you go. them. <laughs> it's um, the only way. It's the only way. Honestly, it is. Um, what you do is you take a little baby alligator and you turn it on its back. And then they have a cloaca, right? The cloaca is their joint uh, orifice for both their waste products and their um, reproductive, you know, organs. Right. Oh, lovely. Yeah, it is lovely. It's a wonderful system. They just have all the plumbing goes into one one place. It's efficient. Um, efficient but messy. <laughs> and so sure. you flip them over on their back, and they have a. You can see their cloaca, and you kind of have to use your fingers to simultaneously squeeze the cloaca and spread it apart so that their um, uh, reproductive organs will. Uh, evert will come out of the cloaca and you'll be able to see based on the color and based on the size whether it's a penis or whether it's a clitoris. Interesting. Wow. Yeah. Science is gross. <laughs> <laughs> Dang. So what, what's the next stage of your experiment after these eggs hatch? Will you go find more eggs? So I have my, this is a pilot, what, what do you call a pilot study? This is the first time I've done a study like this and we have to see if it's going to work okay. first. And assuming that it works and we get some reliable data and it goes pretty smoothly, I want to do another follow-up experiment where, because this is just one population of alligators from Louisiana that we're looking at, right? And you can, I think it's reasonable to assume that populations from different areas might react differently to climate change, right? I mean, alligators have really wide ranges. There are alligators in South Florida, there are alligators in the Carolinas, Right, And those are very different climates that they live in. So what I want to do is I want to get eggs from those different types of climates, expose them to the same warming treatments that I'm doing now, see does every population respond the same way that these Louisiana eggs are going to respond. Because that could really indicate what's going to happen to alligators in the future, right? Like mm -hmm. if the South Florida population, if those eggs react very strongly to warming and either have higher death rates or they have get or the sex ratios get thrown out of whack very strongly, then that could mean that the South Florida population might decrease, you know, more quickly than in other parts of their range. But at the same time, maybe the North Carolina gators, maybe they actually benefit from climate change, right? And huh. maybe there's um, maybe the eggs develop faster and maybe they're able to reach sexual maturity faster and maybe the reproduction rate goes up in those populations. And so you could see this sort of shift in where the alligator strongholds are in their range. You know, Florida could start to lose alligators in 100, 200, 300 years, whereas places like the Carolinas could become more alligator heavy and maybe, you know, they even expand northwards into places like Virginia or Maryland or somewhere like that. So if Florida's alligator population were to disintegrate like this... Um what would happen to our ecosystems? Uh, it would be pretty dramatic, I think. But I, I just want to make it clear that there's no there's no danger of that happening anytime soon. Oh, right? phew. Alligators <laughs> Love a good are, alligator. So. Alligators are here to stay okay. uh, for, the, for the foreseeable future. There's about one and a half million alligators in Florida, and that's not going to change anytime soon. My research is focused on what's going to happen in at the end of this century, right? And like what the far future could look like. Um, and... If, you know, a worst case scenario comes to pass where we get really extreme climate change, really big temperature changes, and that ends up affecting the alligator sex ratios to the point where they can't reproduce as effectively. If we lose alligators here in Florida, I mean, one, it's changing. Like, that's our iconic state animal, you know, like whenever anybody thinks of Florida, the first thing you think of is either alligators or probably like South Beach, right? Like, I feel like those are two the two main or hurricanes. Mm -hmm. Right. Probably alligators and hurricanes are the two main things you would associate with Florida. Most people who don't live in Florida. Um, so like we'd lose a piece of our state identity, you know, I mean, that's our state animal and we're known for it and we would lose it. And then from an ecological perspective, research has repeatedly shown that if you lose a large predator from an ecosystem, it changes an ecosystem dramatically. In most cases, you look at a place like Yellowstone national park, you know, where they lost the wolves. Um, the wolves were extirpated from the park for about 70 years. And in those 70 years, the park, you know, the vegetation changed, the types of animals that were able to survive there changed. And it was uh, a lot of it has been tied to the fact that these wolves weren't there sort of controlling things and helping balance things out. Um, and that's been shown for uh, many populations of large predators all over the world. 
world. Um, so I would assume the same thing would happen with alligators. If we lost alligators, you know, you lose that sort of uh, top level predator that's helping to control different prey populations, keep things in balance. Um, and things would just things would just change. I'm, I wouldn't say they would get worse, you know, but because I don't know what worse means in that context. But it's just that we might have, you know, some other um, animals that used to be uh, that used to benefit from there being alligators around. They might disappear because they don't have the alligators protecting them anymore, you know. Yeah. I mean, one of the things I can think of, you guys ever been to St. Augustine Alligator Farm? Yes. I haven't, no. It's oh, a fantastic we place. Gotta go. I need to go, Jenna. I need to go. I recently went, um, like, maybe a month ago and watched one of the feedings, and yeah. it is wild. Yeah, there are no, it's wild. hundreds of these alligators, and they're crawling on top of each other. It's totally amazing. Yeah. Totally amazing. Stuff. And if you, so St. Augustine Alligator Farm, it's a great example of the benefits that alligators can bring to an ecosystem. So, um, if you go there during the bird breeding season, right? So roughly like January, February through, um, actually I think they're still breeding right now. Um, so wading birds will flock to St. Augustine alligator farm. We're talking like roseate spoonbills and, you know, egrets and herons and just everything you can think of. They come to St. Augustine alligator farm and they nest in trees that are in the alligator pond where there's like 200 alligators, right? And you're thinking, why would wading birds come to a place that's filled with alligators to build their nests? And the reason is that the alligators, not intentionally, obviously, but the alligators protect the nests from predators. Like one of the biggest predators of bird nests is like raccoons, right? Or like possums, things like that. Things are arboreal animals that can climb trees and then eat the eggs. And if the alligators are around, they're going to eat any possum or raccoon that tries to swim across the water to get to these trees. So the alligators are doing a service for the wading birds. If there were no alligators, you would probably see higher predation rates on the bird eggs. And then you would see decreases in the wading bird populations, right? That mm. is fascinating. Yeah. I saw connected. tons of spoonbills when I was there yeah. like a month ago. I love the spoonbills. They're beautiful. They're and the I, I thought... I don't know. I didn't realize that they had just shown up. Yeah. That's incredible. They choose that spot specifically. Right. And you can see it repeatedly throughout Florida. There's places where if you find large groups of alligators where there are, you know, trees for birds to be able to use, um, more likely than not, there are going to be waiting, some number of waiting birds there who choose that location to build their nest because it's safe. Now, the trade-off is what the alligators get out of this arrangement is if little nestlings, little uh, nestling birds fall oh. out of the nests, mm. it's like popcorn, you mm -hmm. know, like popcorn shrimp for an alligator. Mm -hmm. They just scoop them right up. So they do, the, both sides are benefiting um, from this arrangement. You call it a mutualism. I was going to say symbiotic relationship. From my science class, is that right? No, it is. Yeah, it's a yeah. symbiotic relationship. The more nailed it, nailed it. <laughs> you do. You get Eighth an A plus. Science. You get an A plus. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so we'd love to know about your own use of the library. Do you use the library often for your research? Not so, just our library, but any library. Yes, definitely. I use the UNF library all the time. There, the UNF library is amazing. I don't know. Do you guys have a relationship with the UNF library we or do. anything like that? We sure do. Yeah. So the UNF, the UNF library is great, and what I use them for mainly is. You know, I'm um, trying to read scientific literature all the time. And um, scientific journals can be very expensive to gain access to. And so the UNF library doesn't have, like, pay access to all of these different science. There's thousands, of, you know, hundreds of thousands of scientific journals, and they can't afford to buy subscriptions to all of them. But um, there's something called interlibrary loan, mm -hmm. where you go to, you know, your local uh, librarian and you say, you know, I'm looking for this article from this journal. Can you find me a copy? And at UNF, they find me a copy within, like, a day or two. And it's amazing. I've been at universities where it takes like a month and UNF does it in like two days and I'm like oh my, this is amazing so you can get almost anything you want without the university having to pay those subscription fees it's really fantastic right. I think that's one of the little known secrets of libraries is that we all share yeah and whatever you know we've probably borrowed books from the UNF library um here in Jacksonville right Jacksonville yeah Public academic library. libraries and public libraries do it too yeah mm -hmm. and library I, all the amazing. academic libraries are linked with each other I mean right. not all of them but you know like usually like in the state of Florida all of the state libraries um this the all of the state university libraries are linked to each other right and mm -hmm. they can share materials mm -hmm. right. so it's like we can even though we only have the UNF library we can benefit from the Florida State Library and from the University of Florida Library and take advantage of their collections too and that's just it's a great system mm-hmm that's awesome. And yeah. we've heard that you have an actual baby of your own, <laughs> not do. just alligator baby. Not babies, an alligator baby. But an Human actual baby. baby. I have babies on all fronts. <laughs> yes, I have a nine-month-old daughter, um, and uh, she was born here in Jacksonville. We like moved here in August, and then she was born in October, and it was just wow. like craziness. 
Um, but yeah, we take her to our local branch of the public library in Mandarin, uh, for story time. And, you know, she likes to watch all the other children just play and stuff. And yeah, the library is a, um, very important part of our lives. That's awesome. Growing her up good. Yeah. yeah in the good library. Yes. The Jacksonville <laughs> public library also raised me. So, and I'm sure there and were some alligators Brian. and producer Brian. And I'm sure there were some alligators hanging out in our libraries at some point. There I had to be. Southeast I mean, has like a little pond in the back and I've heard they've seen a couple. Ooh, spooky. Check it out. I mean, almost it's a safe to assume that almost any body of freshwater in Florida has an alligator or had an alligator at some point. Mm-hmm. And that's one of the safety things I tell people, you know, is that if you're worried about alligators and, you know, people who grew up in Florida know this, but if you come from out of state, you don't usually know it, that um, you should assume that almost any water body has an alligator in it and you should be cautious about that. Mm-hmm. Well, I'm an experienced alligator trapper, so I don't really have a... <laughs> oh yeah, Jenna, talk to us a little bit about your... Have you actually trapped alligators? Mm-hmm. My dad, I grew up in northwest florida so niceville is the town the panhandle yes in the panhandle okaloosa county and my dad is um a wild works in a wildlife office and he used to be our county's alligator trapper for nuisance alligators for the state so there was many times coming home that there was an alligator taped up in our laundry room because it was too hot to keep him outside (laughs) and so yeah and I've gone with him a couple times when he gets calls from the state saying hey this person has one in their pool or in their small small pond then he gets the permit to go and keep right you know trap them alive and then release them in a safe area so growing up in high school everyone would come to my house hey you got any alligators over there so it was pretty interesting, but That's yeah. fantastic. I actually want to go out. I've never been on a nuisance alligator like uh, call and I'd really like to go. I'm trying to get in touch with the, I think there's two people in Duval County who oh, are cool. the nuisance alligator trappers and I want to link up with them. I want to go out on a call with them and like see how they get alligators out of pools and stuff. I think it'd be really fun. It's super interesting. Yeah. yeah. My dad and his friend like bought their own little John boat to do it and had all, you know, had a relationship with some butcher shop that would give them cow hearts and all kinds of stuff. Yeah. To yeah, they like throw it the put it on a treble hook, throw it over a tree, tie it somewhere, and then come back later and see if anything's on the line. So they would actually bait the alligators. They wouldn't try if to they catch were, them if they were small enough. Like yeah. if they could see that the alligator was pretty small, they would do that. If if not, they would go in the boat and like harpoon them or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Gotcha. Mm-hmm. So yeah. Wow. <laughs> You're I ain't scared of no gator. I know. You're a Florida princess. It's <laughs> just what you do when yeah. you grow up in Florida. Right. Exactly. It's you normal. catch alligators. Yeah. <laughs> So, Dr. Rosenblatt, we asked this at the end of all of our interviews. We want to know, when you were a kid, what did you want to be when you grew up? Um, That's a great question. Uh, The first thing I wanted to be, I mean, was probably a baseball player. But then I realized very quickly that I did not have the not have the skills for that. I think when I went from Little League to what's after Little League? Pony League? I think it's called Pony League. No, really? does that ring we a bell? We had ponytail league, so maybe that's it. Right. <laughs> I'm pretty sure the next level up from little league is called pony league, if I remember correctly. And I remember I went, I like did you know a bunch of little league, and then I went to pony league and tried it for like half a season, and like everybody was pitching so fast, and I was just like, this isn't for me. I don't have the, I don't have the uh, the 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 metal to stand in here and you know withstand these <laughs> fast. You know, in, in reality, the pitchers were probably going like 70 miles an hour, right? It's not that fast if you're looking at. Uh, pitchers in general, but that's neither here nor there. So yeah, baseball players. And then um, after that, pretty soon I realized I wanted to be a scientist because um, I really like being a know-it-all. And I grew up in a family of lawyers and they are um, very intimidating intellectually, right? And like it seemed like growing up they knew everything, um, and but they didn't know anything about science. So I was like, science, that's where I can make my mark and I can be the know-it-all in my family in the scientific realm. So like probably around like 12 or 13, I knew I wanted to be a scientist. Wow. Yeah. What a smart move. Then they can't tell you if you're wrong or not. You could have just made stuff up and they would have no idea. Exactly. My mom is a walking dictionary. And if I like mispronounce anything or if I like use a word wrongly and she's like, that's not how that word is supposed to be used, she'll call you on it immediately, you know? But now I have all of these scientific words that she doesn't know and I can use them however I want Boom. and she doesn't have to. She doesn't have to correct me. Aha, uh-huh, got you, Mom. <laughs> Show them. Yeah, I bet that makes Thanksgiving a lot more fun. <laughs> it is a lot more fun, for sure. That's awesome. Well, Dr. Rosenblatt, thank you so much for coming on the show today. It has been a blast picking your brain about alligators and then some. Yeah, thanks for having me. And if you you know want to uh, come see some baby alligators in August <gasps> out yes. on campus, 
Yes, 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 yes. You, you are going can... to regret having invited us. <laughs> you could make a field trip. We are there. You could make a field Absolutely. trip. Absolutely. Oh, yes. We are there. It's going to be fun. Let us know. Yeah. Please. Will do. Thank you so much. Thank you. So we spoke with Dr. Rosenblatt a month ago. Mm -hmm. That's what you just heard. And today is, of course, a month later. And we have just gotten back from UNF where we got to meet nine baby alligators. They hatched, you guys. It worked. They hatched. They did it. They were so cute. I know. Did you have a favorite one? I don't know. I like the little pile of all of them. Just yeah. like they were all laying on top of each other, I guess, because they like to be warm. And um, they were just so cute. They're they all sleeping. So he was saying that it's like really, I guess, tiring for them to hatch in general. It's just like a long, I don't know, like energy exploding process, I guess. Yeah, so right. they all just, like, they don't eat for like the first four days because they just sleep and like kind of regain energy. Yeah. And they're getting nutrients from their yolk sacs still, yep. which is so cool. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Biology, man. It's crazy. I know. I wish it was this interesting when I was in school. Same. I think if there had been baby alligators involved when I was in school, I would have been way more into science. Yes. And we got to go on the roof of the undisclosed building to see all the other nests that have not hatched yet. We did. It was so cool. And if you go on our blog, jackspubliclibrary.org slash podcast, you can see me calling to a nest dr rosenblatt taught me how let me just tell you i think i'm a pretty convincing alligator mother don't you think jenna yes yeah were you like looking around thinking oh my gosh is there an alligator there's a mama alligator here no it's just Just early early. just Mm -hmm. early so the reason that you do this apparently is they're underneath these like barrels of hay not barrels but you know like little mound of um straw and so he says that he'll stick his head in there and then call like a mama alligator and listen to see if the babies underneath the straw have are calling back so you can tell if they've hatched. So and Hurley cool. got to do that. I did. I did. I did not hear any calling back to no. me, though I pretended to mm-hmm. and everybody chuckled because it was pretty funny. Sure hilarious. <laughs> so funny over here. <laughs> yeah, it was such a treat to meet all nine of them mm-hmm. fresh into the world. So blinking cute. their little eyes open, closing them very quickly because they're very sleepy. So sleepy alligators. They're oh, so cute. They were great. So I guess they're going to stay at the Jacksonville Zoo for the next month. They so are. So some professionals can care for them. They're getting the best care, people, rest assured. And he, oh, that's the other reason. He said that um, since they're so sleepy, he hasn't been able to determine their sex yet to right. see if his hypothesis was correct. Exactly. So the experiment is not yet over, but yep. we will keep you all updated because we are definitely staying in touch with Dr. Rosenblatt so we can know the results of this experiment. It's fascinating. Make sure you subscribe to our show wherever you listen and rate us. Leave us a review Five if you stars. would like. Five stars, please. Five of them. Nine of them. Nine for every baby alligator we met today. Yep. But five will do. Mm-hmm. There were five alligators there. At least. <laughs> like us on Instagram and follow us on Twitter and Facebook at Jack's Library or on Facebook. It's Jacksonville Public Library. Look it up. Look it up. There will be photos of the baby alligators. Don't miss those on our website at jackspubliclibrary.org slash podcast. Slash podcast. This podcast was produced by Brian Thomas, a.k.a. BT, a.k.a. Producer, Producer Brian. Brian. Goodbye. Yeah.